My name is Adam Schmidt. I'm a third year resident in the Department of Dermatology here at Mayo Clinic. I'm here to discuss a new article coming out in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings next month entitled Evidence-Based Screening Recommendations for Occult Cancers in the Setting of Newly Diagnosed Extramammary Paget's Disease. Uh, the study is a retrospective review of um, over 200 cases of extramammary Paget's disease that were evaluated here at Mayo Clinic. Um, we tried to exclude any cases that were recurrences, so we were just looking at new uh, primary diagnoses. Extramammary Paget's disease is a fairly rare disorder. Um, it was initially uh, described in the late 19th century, um, um, first as mammary Paget's disease, that was the first Paget's disease uh, described by Dr. Pagets in 1874 um, when he noticed uh, an unusual rash uh, on the breast of patients who had an underlying breast cancer. Um, but in the following years it was discovered that a similar rash would appear in what we call apocrine rich areas, namely the genital areas, the anorectal um, region, um, and the uh, armpits. Um, so these areas were susceptible to developing a similar rash and it was discovered that um, they have the same type of characteristic cells under the microscope. So those are the Paget cells, um, but they're not on the breast. So that's why they're extra mammary uh, diseases. And it's been known for some time that there's an underlying risk of cancer, um, but it's very poorly defined what that risk is. Um, and whether the cancer is what we called in our paper contiguous, meaning that there's an underlying cancer and it spreads to include the skin, um, or whether the risk is that there's a distant or um, non-synchronous cancer, um, or non-contiguous cancer, I should say, um, that's somewhere else in the body. So for example, if you had extra mammary Paget's disease in the genital area, but at the same time had a diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, there have been correlations uh, described in the past, but no real good guidelines for, for what to assess for and how to assess for it. And uh, trying to see what screening practices were performed um, and try to come up with an algorithm to sort of guide uh, clinicians when they are faced with a new diagnosis of extra mammary Paget's disease. So in reviewing the um, over 200 cases uh, here at Mayo, uh, we discovered that screening practices were all over the board. Um, about 18% of people got no screening whatsoever for an underlying cancer, and then other patients would get five, six, seven, eight tests, including PET scans and, and uh, biopsies and everything in between. So our goal was to really define what should you do, um, or at least what is the bare minimum of what you should do when confronted with um, a new diagnosis of extramammary Paget's disease. Uh, so what this means for clinicians is that uh, you should perform uh, cancer screening. That was the, the number one sort of conclusion of our study is that um, 11, just over 11% of patients had a distant or what we call the non-synchronous um, cancer discovered within one year of the diagnosis of extramammary Paget's disease. Um, and so the, the main sites of that were breast and urinary tract for women. And for men, it was uh, the prostate was the number one site. Um, and so we concluded that, um, you know, a basic examination. Um, we found that everybody should have a at least a colonoscopy and urine cytology because those were the two highest yield tests that were performed um, across the spectrum and, and were the most likely to produce a positive result. Uh, for women, uh, mammography should also be performed as well as a pap smear. For men, uh, they should also have a, a PSA uh, plus or minus a digital rectal exam to, to evaluate for an underlying prostate cancer. So um, at least uh, that set of screening should be performed because 
In our study, there was an elevated risk of both a non-contiguous malignancy as well as a contiguous malignancy. So the, the second part of um, our recommendations was to really evaluate the biopsy or excision specimens. Um, in our mind, when you, when you have a new diagnosis of extramammary Paget's disease, if you've taken an excision or you've taken a biopsy, that should be very, very carefully screened um, either the whole periphery or at least serial sectioning to look for invasive disease um, because that could also have prognostic um, implications. So for our patients, we hope that this um, provides uh, very distinct guidelines for their clinicians to help um, in the evaluation of both their primary diagnosis or the initial diagnosis of extramammary Paget's disease but also knowing that they're at a higher risk for an underlying cancer and how to evaluate for that. So our goal is that they get appropriate screening so that nothing is missed, but also so that they don't get excessive screening that um, maybe is unnecessary in terms of um, invasive measures or, or cost to the patient. Um, so extramammary Paget's disease is a rare disorder um, with a delayed diagnosis due to its rarity and the fact that it um, mimics other much more common disorders. Um, we do see a fairly high number of it here uh, given that we're a tertiary referral center and um, so our goal with the study was to collect all the data that we've amassed through the years um, um, through the cases that have been evaluated and treated here and uh, try to come up with an algorithm or some guidelines for how to approach a new diagnosis of extramammary Paget's disease. Um, essentially, we found that uh, people are at a higher risk for an underlying malignancy and that they should undergo screening as outlined in our algorithm. Uh, with further um, testing and treatment based on the findings of, of that initial evaluation. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www. Dot Mayo Clinic Proceedings dot org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about health care at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.